Hello, welcome back to the auditorium, to the cafe downstairs. I know you're down there. <laughs> I can almost see you, so please come up as soon as you finish your coffees. And to our cyber friends, I hope you enjoyed your lunch and you're ready for our next speaker who's here with us live. I would like to introduce and invite over Professor Fiona Kearney. She's the director of the recently awarded Glaxman University College Cork in Ireland, and she will explore creative agency, community empowerment through contemporary art practices. Fiona, please. Um. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank all the organizers of Co Museum, um, but especially Katrina, Sophia, Maria, Dina. I'm a, an A, uh, I'm a Fiona. Um, but just for the wonderful way in which you've embodied the theme of the conference and looking after us. So thank you. Um, I want to think about how we can be uh, full of care, but maybe not too careful, too tentative in our actions. I think perhaps now more than ever, we need to support our artists to take creative risk, to demonstrate adventurous thinking in our own museums and collaborate with our communities to provide thought leadership in our regions. And for me, this means the Glucksmann Gallery in University College Cork, um, which is a civic museum, a contemporary art museum on the campus, a very historic campus, um, right in the city centre. So it was always conceived as a civic space where people could meet the ideas and research that happens within our university. And I just thought I would give you a quick overview of what that looks like. It means that we partner across all areas of our university, um, whether that is within the humanities, on issues around global borders, with our colleagues in science, looking at how artists um, explore the science of light, um, looking at uh, themes and art on the market with our business school, with our English department, thinking about how we commemorate and remember through photographic practices, with um, a leading center on the microbiome, the relationship between the brain and the gut, looking at circadian rhythms, um, and most recently on uh, uh, an exhibition called Park Life, which we did in collaboration with our school of biological earth and environmental sciences, which was very specifically addressing climate action. Um, but of course, like so many of you, we look to collaborate outwards as well. And we've just recently um, closing out a project that we have done in partnership with museums in Italy and Croatia on how we might um, look at the museum displays, picking up on the extraordinary uh, comments earlier on um, by Brenda about the importance of objects and tactility um, on how we might make exhibition displays accessible for people with visual impairment. Um, we've collaborated with our colleagues in the School of Law, commissioning seven Irish artists to develop and respond to themes within the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I'll come back to this. And all this because our audience ranges from, as we say, zero to 100 years. And um, we have a very large schools program. Um, we obviously take care of the students on our own campus but we actively think about our graduates and our staff and the older people in the communities around us. And I suppose all of this really to say that when we had to close the museum because of COVID, um, we did what most of us did. We went online and we presented programs um, kind of in a, in a bonkers way. We did a new video every day and it was hugely successful with, for us in that it reached a global audience. We worked with the Irish embassies around the world um, but I think we probably had more people participating outside of Cork and outside of Ireland than we did within our own communities locally. So while we did a number of different workshops and drawing practices and art clubs all online and engaged with our own community of contemporary curators with conversations um, with people such as Ruin Grupo or the curators of Documenta this year, um, again, the participation was not necessarily from the communities that we would normally serve. And we were thinking about how we could address that. So 
while the museum was closed, we developed a series of programs where we commissioned local artists to present works on billboards. And we did them as a series of five routes through the city so that people could walk and discover these works um, for themselves. Just in very kind of simple, they weren't big statement billboards. They're very much designed to be about discovering your city in this time when in Ireland, at least, we were initially confined to two kilometers around your home, then five kilometers. And at the time when we brought this out, we had been given 20 kilometers, which felt like this sudden massive distance to explore. So because you were allowed to come into the city center to do your shopping, we had these little routes all within that 20 kilometers for people to move around. One of the artists that we worked with is an artist called Leanne McDonough. She's an extraordinary artist. She's also a traveler woman. The traveler community in Ireland are an indigenous Irish ethnocultural group um, who experience incredible discrimination going about their everyday lives. Um, and Leanne has an extraordinary presence within her community. She's one of the first people from her community to have gone to art college. Um, but the work itself that she makes addresses the representations that she feels um, of her community that need to be balanced out by an understanding of her own lived experience. And this is a work called Pavi Presence. Pavi is one of the names that the Minkair or the traveler community call themselves. And it's an image which seems abstract, it's very colorful, it's very joyful. But if you look into it, you can start to make out the shape of a horse's head. And it is an abstracted image from a horse fair. And very deliberately, Leanne is trying to counter images such as these kind of photo documentary images that often seek to portray, yes, the reality of the poverty of the Minkair community, but perhaps, as Leanne would say, not the joy or wonderful associations that they have with the experience of the horse fair themselves. And she mentioned to me when we put this work out, and we were really thinking now about our communities being able to explore the city, she said, I am so thrilled to be doing this project because now, some of my community who will never go to the Glucksman will get an opportunity to see my art. And I said, but Leanne, you know how welcome they are. And we are very proud to have been designated as a traveler ally institution, which really says there's an extended welcome for this community within our space. But she just said, it doesn't matter what you do. There are some people within my community who will always want to be outside moving around. That's in our nature. And this exhibition allows them to see my work. So I just want you to hold that thought. Another community that we were thinking about was this community of refugees and asylum seekers that we have been working with in the Glucksman for over nine years now. It was a journey that began when a colleague of mine in applied social studies sent around an email at Christmas time looking for a little bit of support to have a party for children that were living within our accommodation system. It's called direct provision in Ireland. And I got this email with this extraordinary image on it. It says, I hate hotel, a stupid hotel. And this other beautiful image, um, but which also says, I am so, so sad. And I don't think any one of us who work in art or in engagement could not be profoundly affected by the extraordinary talent and ability that you see in this expression, but directed towards such terrible ends. Um, so over the last eight years, we have worked with this community to bring them onto campus and to have them, I suppose, develop confidence to express their voices and views in the public realm. Um, we've got it completely wrong at times. I promised the organizers that I would speak about the kind of many missteps that we have made. Um, when we first wanted to bring them into the museum, we had everything set up, all the free materials, all the, and we are, as you see in this beautiful, lower ground setting of the university, and of course coming from their confined spaces. What did they want to do? Just run around outside and play. So we started to develop programs for them that would take them out into nature and benefit from their thing, rather than try to force them back into small spaces that in a way we were trying to give them some sense of relief from. And I remember when um, we had a screening of a work, a film that they developed at a local film festival, and they did a panel discussion. One of the young participants, Sana, said that the Glucksman has become like home to me, a place where you can come and express yourself. 
And I thought, this is, you know, I felt really, really proud um, that they would view the museum as a place that was their space. But of course, when we became confined to that two kilometers around our own home and we're all on Zoom and on the phone with each other, kind of giving out about having to be at home, you know, with our, our supposed loved ones, um, I kept thinking about what about if your place of residence is not your home? What about those people that are now confined to these accommodation centers? So although the museum was closed, we immediately thought to send out some artworks to them so that they would know that we were thinking about them. We sent out, um, we did a kind of a creative pack drive, and we tried to ensure that they had access to internet so that they could engage with some of the, the programs that we were doing online. But as soon as we possibly could, we kind of really picked up on that idea of working outside and around the museum, because we were allowed to obviously do things um, around the spaces of our museum, to develop projects with them that would take place outdoors. And I suppose, this was a very new idea for us because where the university is situated is in this um, very, very beautiful historic campus with a kind of a, 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 a ceremonial gate in front of it, but that can often feel like a barrier to many people. And I think that for us, we felt our role was to reach out to bring people in, not just to the museum, but to the extended world of the university and all that that might offer. Um, so moving beyond our gates, as we did in these projects, where we began and got permission from our city council to develop large-scale murals in our city centre, which um, the young people installed themselves and had great pride, I think, in the fact that they were doing that, um, went across all of our city. Um, and of course, during this time of COVID, this kind of transformation of the urban realm was something that people were really interested in because we were so much more alert to what was going on in our immediate surroundings. So we had this very captive set of audiences. Um, and we somehow got permission from our uh, the, the city library, right, this wonderful building in the center of the city, to work with their facade as well, and to communicate these messages and ideas that the young people wanted to have discussed in the public realm. And we used the heft of our gallery to promote it the way we would have promoted our exhibitions that we weren't able to show. And we managed to get a lot of coverage and discussion um, into the media in a very positive way, um, which hasn't always been the case around the discussion um, of immigration in Ireland. And so we were emboldened. We thought, what can we do next? Um, this is one of the murals that I mentioned that were a response to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. It's by an artist called Kathy Burke. She works under the type, uh, the, the nom de plume Fatty Burke. And this was um, responding to the idea of equality. So it's a wonderful equal sign. But when I looked at it, I always thought it reminded me of a road, like a road sign. That, um, and so we asked her if she would consider working with families experiencing homelessness, so young children who, again, you know, it's unbearable to think about, but you know, really were, had no permanent place of abode during COVID. And we organized a series of workshops with them. We did this in complete collaboration with the care and support workers that work on an everyday basis. So it's hugely important for my team, we have a very small team who don't have that expertise, to collaborate with our colleagues in Idel House, it's called, in Good Shepherd, to work alongside us so that there was care for the children being provided along with these creative opportunities for the artist. Um, but again, we got permission somehow from the city council to install the work in one of the most central streets of the city, Oliver Plunkett Street. And the children themselves came and helped us to paint on this mural onto the road. And it was very important for the artist because she had worked really closely with the children coming down to Cork to do a series of workshops with them. And as you might imagine, we've spoken about, you know, previously about these ideas of how art can look to give space to dealing with trauma. But these are young people who are in the midst still of, of, of a trauma. And um, many of them spoke about the nightmares that they had had. And one child was speaking about the snakes coming together. And Fatty said, well, you know, the snakes don't have to be bad. The snakes could be this kind of wonderful, playful thing. Think of snakes and ladders. And that made it 
onto the mural. This is the finished mural seen from above. And one of the, all the ideas came from the children themselves. There was that idea of sharing food at a table, that our different cultures can come together around shared hospitality. Um, the idea of the snake or the serpent being turned into something that is made out of all the different flags of different countries represented here. And then that wonderful sense of play, a playful city, a city that might make space um, for all children um, and to think about those public realm areas being transformed in this way. We had a fantastic launch for it and we kind of then forgot about it, not in a funny way, but it became this kind of sleeper Instagram hit in the city. Uh, it came into a life of its own, as you might imagine, when the bars started to close and people came out onto this street and found a whole different way to play with it. But we had little QR codes all along the street, which is how this gentleman found out in total official speak exactly what we were doing, to communicate again what this might mean in a deeper way for people that were engaging with it as a kind of a beautiful part of um, our cityscape. And so in this new connection that we had developed with the City Council, we um, brought together a team doing that kind of work that we've been doing in our exhibition practice, connecting the university with the wider public realm, but this time using different parts of research expertise. So we partnered with our colleagues in occupational therapy and occupational health. Um, with colleagues in the Centre for Planning, Education and Research. So this is where city planners do their master's programmes. And then in, within the City Council itself, we worked with the Director of Services there and the planners themselves on a project that was to go out to all the schools in Cork, 50 schools in the city, to ask them what they would like their city to look like, with the very deliberate intention that it would help to inform the Cork City Development Plan. And Fergal Reedy, who's the Director of Services, was really keen to hear and listen to children, but just didn't know or didn't have an idea of how that might happen, how it might be included. Um, and I don't know what happened with you with COVID, but we had these kind of bumps and waves that were going on all the time. So suddenly all our plans of having the artists go out into the schools and the children come into the Kluxman were scuppered again because we were closed down again. And so we had to put things online. So what we did was we developed a whole area of our website the artists were extraordinary. They came in and they filmed individual workshops in the city. And then we had a dedicated resource center set up where we worked with the teachers to provide them with the supports to be able to address the work. And myself and my team literally got into our cars and drove around to the 50 schools in Cork City to deliver those big A3 sheets so that each child could have their own response to that question. And then, as they began to make them in the schools, we got permission for the Lord Mayor to go visit, so that was kind of a, a, a big thing for the, the schools themselves. But perhaps more importantly, once we were able to open again, we did a selection of works from the exhibition in the museum. And again, something that we mightn't have done in the past to dedicate one of our beautiful gallery spaces to that kind of education work. But it felt so hugely important as a way to bring back those children who of course are like, talking about ripples, are surrounded by parents and grandparents and loved ones that want to see the museum. It helped to bring our audiences back into the gallery. Um, but the, we made a film about the project and again we partnered with um, our local cinema so we were able to get representatives at least of the 2,000 children that participated in this study to uh, have a kind of a, a wonderful premiere moment. Um, I'm going to show you a short clip of it but um, I did just want to emphasize that while these pictures can make it seem like a beautiful endeavor and I know that when I speak about COVID that you feel the kind of challenge that is involved in making a project like that. No matter when we would do anything of this magnitude, there is an extraordinary level of work and commitment that is needed from the researchers and partners that we have within an academic context. And that translates itself into the challenge of interpreting, you know, 2000 works with some which are very highly developed questions, but one that I remember I, um, very specifically from a young boy because he was in my son's class who has Down syndrome. And it was just this kind of lovely colorful display, but on the back his support teacher had written, 
that he wanted to express the need for better public toilets in our parks and areas so that he could play with his friends. And it was, you know, it's that kind of level of care and interpretation from the teacher that went then to our occupational therapists, our colleagues, who spent over 50 hours with five teams over two weeks analyzing these images so that it could become a formal submission to the city development plan. Because while the intention at the outset had been to make it something, I suppose, of a listening exercise that might look well, you know, this is lovely, we have a sense of what our young people want for the future of the city. If it goes in as a formal submission, it is logged and has to be attended to in a completely different way. And I think for me, I'm just going to show you a very short clip of the city planner, Hugh Killen, and how he was so profoundly affected by this. Essentially, the development plan uh, will be the indicator for, or the guide for growth for Cork City over the next six years. But it, it takes a, a longer time framework uh, for up to right up to 2040. Like there, there, there are not going to be children, five-year-old children or ten-year-old children, who are going to read 700 pages and give us an informed written submission. That's never going to happen. But I think this allows us to quite clearly see what young people want. And if we step back as adults and look at what they're asking for, it'd be pretty cool that in 19 years' time, when they're all adults, that they've influenced a Cork City to be better for young people. Um. So there is no going back. Our museum is open again, and we are now showing works, but actually we are taking them out in a program that we evolved, because we realized that as much as we want to reach out and bring people back to the gallery, we need to also stay outside our walls to enable people who mightn't just ordinarily or easily access contemporary art, but for whom it might be impossible to come and visit the museum. And after COVID, that was specifically um, very particular kinds of audiences. So our older people living in disadvantaged areas of the city wouldn't have the money to get a taxi and didn't feel comfortable to get a bus. So we went out into local libraries where they could walk and we lent them works of art. And we, in the, um, we were supported with, wonderfully by artists who would do projects and events in the libraries themselves. So using an existing network. Similarly with schools, and I'll talk about this a little bit, this is my plug for my masterclass tomorrow, but how we commissioned work with different communities here with a young queer artist who is presenting work in a secondary school and in a rural school, almost falling off into the Atlantic Ocean, sending down works about brutalist architecture and ensuring that they get a discussion about civic and city life that is their educational right. Um, into hospitals where, of course, we still are showing these wonderful works um, and into care homes where, again, communities that might be able to have, I suppose, that sense of interaction. We've continued to partner with Edel House for this space that supports families experiencing homelessness and we're kind of sneakily now coaxing them up into the gallery here to ask them to choose which works they would like to be on display. So we put them out into our spaces so that they could choose it and then they go back into the foyer space or into these kind of very, you know, banal everyday spaces. You know, they're not gallery spaces. But you can see here, do you remember Leanne's work? And one of the women came through Edel House and it was reported back to us that she just said, I can't believe this is by a traveler woman. I'm a traveler woman. I never thought that someone would be showing a work like that. And it goes to that sense of if you can't see it, you can't be it. And where our focus entirely before would have been on trying to get this woman to come to the Glucksman, I think what we've realized with COVID is that what we really want is her own empowerment and that sense of belief in herself and in art to do that. The last project that I'm going to show you is this one that we've just finished. Um, it was with a group of migrant women um, who we worked with during the summer on a series of creative workshops with the artist Joe Caslan. And we're gone crazy now because we're such friends with the city council that we're like, give us these buildings. So we'll do something really mad. They're brilliant. So we got permission to do this huge mural in the city centre. Um, but in Ireland, at least, very often the accommodation centres aren't in the city centre. They are put outside into rural spaces, which make it incredibly difficult for the people kept who are um, being accommodated there to engage 
with the city. Um, and so we wanted to show something of that dichotomy, of that kind of relationship between um, urban and rural spheres. So here, Salama's mural went up. This is right in the center of Cork City. But we also got permission, this is Salama with her work, um, to uh, um, do another mural on the facade of Mallow Castle. And we had to go to the Minister of the Environment to get this permission because obviously this is a protected structure. It is one of the most you know, important part of our own heritage in Ireland. And this is Joyce and her little Baba. Um, and it went on to the cover of, right in the mid, and again in, in, in Mallow, which is, you know, in rural North Cork. But again, we're not too far away. There is an accommodation center. So interestingly enough, it felt very true. And I suppose what we hope in this now new challenge, this new way of working, is that in providing this care and hopefully earning some trust with these communities that we create a sense of belonging, not just in our museum, but in our country. And that hopefully projects like this might lead to a kind of a new set of discussions around what Ireland of the future might look like or what Europe of the future might look like. And that it doesn't have to be oppositional, that it can bring together the most wonderful traditions and traditional heritage with the new citizens and provide something which is protecting and caring for both. I hope you will come to Ireland to visit when you do. <laughs> so, thank you.